As even a casual observer of American politics knows, it's difficult to pass legislation through both houses of Congress and get it signed into law. That's because for a bill to be successful, it must run what seems like an obstacle course through both chambers and survive numerous votes. This cumbersome process is nearly the same in each chamber with a few procedural exceptions. For example, appropriations bills, those that authorize the government to spend money, can only be introduced in the House of Representatives. Let's see how a bill may become a law, though what we're about to see is not followed in the case of every bill. The first step in the legislative process is sponsorship of the bill. A representative or senator or a group of representatives or senators may sponsor a bill for many reasons. Constituents in the legislator's home district or state may ask for specific legislation, or lobbyists working for interest groups may have requested the bill. The president may have publicly pressed for the bill, which a congressional ally would then introduce. Or a legislator may initiate a bill on his or her own accord in order to address an issue important to that member or to a particular constituency. Often, representatives and senators work together to craft the bill and introduce it into both chambers simultaneously. While the bill might begin with similar language, the process of debating and passing the bill in both chambers can result in the final versions of the two bills being different. Once submitted, the bill is given a number. House bills begin with the designation HR and Senate bills with an S. The bill is then assigned by the Speaker of the House or the Senate Majority Leader to a Congressional Committee. The committee chair typically assigns a bill to the relevant subcommittee, which holds hearings to gather more information about the bill, often calling on experts from related fields. The subcommittee then makes recommendations on the bill and sends it back to the full committee, which begins markup of the bill. Markup is the process by which members of a congressional committee debate the merits and content of the bill, amending and rewriting it as necessary. Then, either the bill is reported to the House or Senate as ready for consideration by that entire body, or it is tabled, meaning that it is no longer under consideration. Committees can block consideration of a measure by not reporting it to the full chamber. Both chambers allow the full body to prevent that blockage by passing a discharge petition, a procedure that forces a bill from the committee onto the chamber's floor for full debate and a vote. The bill writing process involving committees and subcommittees and including hearings is called regular order. Sometimes congressional leadership avoids this process to exercise closer control over the language of a bill deemed to be of high importance. In this case, the leaders of the majority party choose who will write the bill and work closely with them and the White House if the president also comes from the majority party in Congress to finalize the bill and introduce it to the floor for a vote. When a bill is considered by the entire House of Representatives, debate rules for the bill are determined by the Committee on Rules. The Speaker can influence the process here as well by working closely with the chair of the Rules Committee and the majority membership to issue rules that the Speaker wants. The Senate Majority Leader has less power over that chamber, and Senate rules call for debate to be unlimited unless a majority votes to end the debate. Once debate begins, amendments can be added if the rules established for the bill allow it. The House or Senate then votes on the bill, which will pass if a simple majority votes in its favor. If the vote is tied in the Senate, the Vice President casts the deciding vote. The bill is then introduced in the other body of Congress, where it follows the same committee and debate processes. If the bill also passes in the second body, it often does so in a different form. In such cases, a conference committee may be formed to reconcile any differences between the versions of the bill passed by the House and the Senate, or the leadership of the two chambers may simply reconcile the bills. While the time allowed for debate of a bill is limited in the House of Representatives, importantly, the Senate does not limit debate unless there is a unanimous consent agreement. These agreements, entered into by the majority leader or floor manager of a bill, set the grounds for the length of time a bill will be debated, who will control the floor, and possibly what kinds of amendments will be allowed. The Senate's no limits policy has sometimes led to a filibuster, a practice in the Senate of talking a bill to death, aimed at delaying or preventing legislative action. A minority of senators, or just one, 
may delay or prevent legislative action by holding the floor and preventing other senators from speaking. The filibuster enables the minority party to prevent the majority party from quickly debating and voting on a bill. Although the practice is well ingrained in the Senate, it is only established by Senate rules and it is not part of the Constitution. During a filibuster, senators may speak for hours on end and not necessarily about the legislation at hand. For example, in 1957, South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond spoke for more than 24 hours to prevent a vote on that year's Civil Rights Act from taking place. A few years later, in 1964, a 60-day filibuster took place by Southern senators who would only yield to each other. Again, the attempt was intended to block action on civil rights legislation. Filibusters in the Senate can be forced to a close, however. In 1917, the Senate adopted Rule 22, which established cloture or closure and permitting the Senate to end debate on a bill with a three-fifths majority vote. When Rule 22 was originally passed, it allowed the Senate to vote to limit debate with a two-thirds majority vote. This percentage turned out to be difficult to achieve. After only four of 23 cloture motions were successfully voted on between 1919 and 1960, the Senate amended Rule 22 in 1975 to require only a three-fifths majority vote. Even after both houses of Congress pass a bill, it still must go to the president before it becomes law. When the president gets the bill, one of several things can happen. First, the president may sign the bill, in which case it becomes law. Second, the president may do nothing, in which case the bill becomes law after 10 days, unless Congress adjourns within those 10 days, in which case the bill is killed in what is called a pocket veto. Third, the president may veto a bill. If the president vetoes a bill, the bill may still become law if two-thirds of members in both houses vote to override a veto, a high threshold that is difficult for Congress to achieve. Importantly, in the 21st century, Senate majority parties have made modifications to the filibuster. Some members of Congress threatened to remove the option of the filibuster entirely by changing the rules to allow only a simple majority vote to end debate. In 2013, Democrats voted along party lines to enact the so-called nuclear option, changing the rules to allow for a simple majority of 51 votes to approve presidential cabinet nominees and nominees for judgeships below the Supreme Court. In 2017, the Republican majority changed the rule to include Supreme Court nominees. 